Hello again, staff students. Back here with the second lesson of the chi-square unit. Uh, chi-square test for independence. We'll also uh, reference chi-square test for homogeneity in here, which is uh, very similar, um, but slightly different in terms of where the data comes from. It's a, a design difference that we'll, we'll get into a little bit. Uh, so what we want to know is when do we use this? So again, this is this when do we use this is really uh, as opposed to the chi-square goodness of fit. And the chi-square goodness of fit, again, if you think about observed values, the chi-square goodness of fit had really one column of numbers or one row of numbers in terms of the observed values. And so that's going to be one of the big differences, and it really comes down to how many different variables are involved, um, not necessarily how many groups within one categorical variable, um, you know, not how many religions are included, but is religion included and race included, or is uh, grade included and high school included? Um, so that notion of having two variables included um, as opposed to just grade or just high school being included, which is what happened here where there was one categorical variable on the goodness of fit problems. So what data characteristics prompt us to use this, which again is the one versus two categorical variables, which we'll get into even more as we get into this. Uh, how might it look in our research work and ultimately what makes it uh, different from the other type of chi-square test, which again is what we what I was referencing right here with the, the one or two categorical variables. So here's an example. Uh, research, in, uh, whether in business, medicine, or otherwise, deal with many scales. So in this example, research has asked a random sample of 7,440 people of all ages how important personal appearance was on this scale from one to seven on an effort to determine if your age affected how important personal appearance was. So one thing to note here is if you look at this, age is one categorical variable and personal appearance rating is the other categorical variable. So there are two categorical variables in play here and those categorical variables then will ultimately create the table that allows us to run this test. So in terms of how we set this up then to begin with, uh, as we had previously, it's about our hypotheses in the beginning, and it's really about the two variables being independent of each other. Um, is categorical variable one and categorical variable two, are they independent or are they not independent? And just a heads up on this one right here is sometimes students will say they're dependent, and you just have to be careful in that situation that if you use the term dependent, it has to really go a certain way. Um, and what I mean by that is, you can't say that somebody's age is dependent on how important personal appearance was because if I rate a personal appearance as important, that's not going to fundamentally change my age. Um, but if I, on the other side of it, my age could affect how, I th how important I think personal appearance is. And so um, if you say not independent, then it doesn't really force a direction. If you say dependent, then you're really saying one variable is the X and one variable is the Y, if you will. Um, and sometimes that can be an inaccurate statement because your age would not change just because you thought personal appearance was more or less important. Um, so as always, HA is what we're trying to find evidence for. And so when we write our conclusion, we will literally restate that there is or there is not evidence for HA. That would be the last line of a test that we would run here. So the hypotheses in our example here the null hypothesis would be that age and one's rating of the importance of personal appearance are independent. Again, it's always independent uh, as the null hypothesis. Sometimes you'll see uh, different terminology, like you might see uh, there is no association between age and personal appearance. There is no relationship between age and personal personal appearance. Um, so you will see some different terminology, although meaning really independent of each other. So the alternative hypothesis here would be that age and one's rating, dot, 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 I'll just save us some time, of personal appearance are not 
independent. And again, what that means is we're trying to find evidence that your age is going to, de- to, to play a role in how important you think personal appearance is. Um, and so that's what we're trying to find evidence for based off of our sample of a little over 7,000 people. Uh, so as we move into the next step, uh, again, type and conditions, easiest way to verify type is just to write out the formula again. Okay, this technically is a chi-square test for independence. Um, but uh, again, if you just write this and write that general formula, which is the same as the goodness of fit formula, then you actually don't have to make the determination between independence and goodness of fit. The formula just takes care of it for you and you don't have to worry about accidentally saying independence when it's goodness of fit or vice versa. Um, and then similarly, before we can move on, our data needs to be trusted. And then we must check the same two items as the goodness of fit. So for this particular problem, again, we can it's, it is technically a chi-square test for independence but it is okay to just write the formula here. And our conditions again would be number one, that we have a simple random sample. And again, we would simply say question states, and then we'd quote the question. Where does, this, where does the question state something about being a simple random sample? And then number two, just like the goodness of fit, is do we have a large enough sample? And the large enough sample, again, is really checking are all expected values greater than or equal to 5, which is exactly the same as the goodness of fit. And we'll come back to how we verify that. So we do need to verify that, but we really won't do that yet um, because the calculator is going to be the easiest way to determine these um, these expected values. And I'll talk about how you can do it by hand, but the calculator is going to naturally save you a lot of time. So here's our data. This is the observed data that we have. Um, this is extremely big in terms of number of, of rows and columns to the table. Typically, you're going to see three rows by two co columns or two rows by three columns. In this case, we have seven rows by six columns. And what we're really trying to determine is, is somebody more likely to say it's extremely important if they're in the 13 to 19 age group than if they're in the 60 plus age group? Um, and so what happens is, if you look at, in the end, uh, 1,520, and I'll just get this actual value, 1,520 out of 7,440 people rated this a seven as being extremely important. So about 20.4% of people gave a seven rating for personal appearance. So about a, a fifth of the population thinks it's, or a fifth of the sample at least here, thinks that it's extremely important um, that personal appearance um, or that you worry about it. Uh, if it didn't matter what age we had, then what we would expect is we would expect this number here for the youngest age group to be about 20% of that total. We'd expect this number to be about 20% of that total. We'd expect this number to be about 20% of that total and so on. So if you look at the older age group where we have 93 out of 637, in that situation, that's only about 14.6%. So what we're really trying to find is, is this enough evidence to show that the older generation here cares about personal appearance a little bit less. How drastically different is 14.6% from the overall, which was the 1520 over the 7440, which is about 20.4%. Looking back, we could even look at this age group, that's 396 out of 1596, um, that said it's extremely important. And that percentage is actually about 24.8. So you can see the younger generation, not surprisingly, found personal appearance to be even more important than the overall average, whereas the older generation found it to be less important, um, at least in terms of percent who answered with a seven, than the overall group. So what we're trying to find is you could do that same thing for every combination of numbers in this whole table, and we could convert these all to percents in terms of what percent in each age group gave it a seven, what percent gave it a six, and so on. But if they're truly independent, Perfect independence would be that 
if one age group had 20% of people rated a seven, then the next age group would have 20% of people rated a seven. And the next age group would have 20% of people rated, rated a seven. That's true independence. So what we do here is in order to find what the expected values are, and the expected values are based off of true independence. So expected values are based off of true independence. The way that we calculate an expected value by hand is let's say we want to get that, that top left expected value, that youngest age group, highest rating. What we would do is we would take their row total times that column total divided by the table total. And what that really is here is the row total of people who gave it a seven is 1,520. The column total for that age group is 1,596, which is this number right here, over the table total, which is 7,440. Now, this is just another way of basically looking at what we were just talking about, which is that age group over their total versus the overall sevens over that total. Um, and so we calculate that, and that number, 1520 times 1596 divided by 7440, that number here is about 326. So that is saying that we expected about 326 13 to 19 year olds to rate it a seven, we got 396, which again, falls in line with this number, which said basically that a higher percent of, of people in that age group rated seven on the uh, extremely important for personal appearance. And so that's where that observed value, which is here, the observed 396, is bigger than it's expected. Now, you can tell here that doing this formula, which would be 42 times in this, that'd be very time consuming. So you do not have to do that. What you will do is you can use your calculator and to use your calculator here, you would take on your calculator, go to second matrix. So it's actually second X inverse, which is matrix. Okay, and in the matrix area, you're gonna go over to edit. And when you click on edit, it's gonna bring you into an actual matrix. You type in then the number of rows and number of columns. So in this particular problem, it's a seven by six. And then it will give you all those spaces to type in all these numbers. Again, it won't always be this big. It will ba barely ever be this big, but you type in all the numbers from that table, okay? Once you have all the numbers from that table, you quit out of there. And then you go to a stat Sorry about that, stat, tests, and you go to the chi-square test that just says chi-square test and then has dot, 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 which is the for independence after it. And when you click on that chi-square test or, or hit enter to go into the chi-square test, the observed will most likely be in matrix A, so it'll have something that looks like this. The expected, you can just put into matrix B, which is the default setting. Now keep in mind, we haven't put anything into matrix B yet, but when you do that, it will put in your expected values into matrix B. And again, these expected values are condition number two. So you have to, to verify that condition of five or more for each expected, you'd have to go back to condition number two. So we calculate, and when we calculate, not only does it give us the expected values in matrix B, so that's one thing, it also gives us the three big values, which are the chi-square, the degrees of freedom, and the p-value. So degrees of freedom here, it actually calculates for you, but the formula is number of rows minus one, which in this case was seven rows minus one, times number of columns minus one, which was six columns minus one, so six times five or 30 would be our degrees of freedom, which is a very big degrees of freedom for a chi-square test. So for this particular problem, I had put the values in and my chi-square ends up being about 170.78, okay? 
Okay. Now, any work to show for that would be taking that top left observed, subtracting the top left expected, squared, divided by the top left expected, and then you could do something like this. So again, there's 42 iterations of this formula, one for each spot on the matrix. If we write the top left and then the bottom right, and the bottom right is something, the observed value for the bottom right is a small value, in this case, 52, and it's minus some expected value for that one, um, squared over the expected. So if you were to write work, this is what it would look like. You do the top left and the bottom right, and then put this plus dot, 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 plus in between to show there's more of them. We just aren't going to write all of them. Degrees of freedom we've talked about. And then again, the p-value, which in this, in this, sorry, 30 degrees of freedom was our number there. But the p-value in this particular problem, when we calculate, is about 1.24 times 10 to the negative 21st. Okay? Keep in mind, you got to catch that e to the negative 21, the p-value is not just 1.24, that would be 124% chance of something happening. So you do have to catch that it actually has 20 zeros in front of that one. Um, so it's a very small p-value, which just means on the actual curve, we are way, way, way out there um, with our test statistic being 170.78, even though it's 30 degrees of freedom, which does push the, the big part of the curve out to the right um, because we just have more iterations of the formula, but we have a tiny p-value. And again, that tiny p-value just speaks to the strength of evidence. So we write our conclusion with the p-value versus typically a 0.05 alpha. Um, and so our decision here, because our p-value was less than 0.05, we would reject, which means there is evidence for HA. Uh, and in, so in terms of our conclusion, and again, I won't put you through the whole thing here, but based on our evidence, based on our evidence, the p-value was about, what was it, 1.24 times 10 to the negative 21 is less than 0.05. We reject the null hypothesis, so there is evidence for, and then what you just do there is write HA in context. And so if you remember, HA here was that age and one's rating for personal appearance are not independent. And so you would say that there is evidence that they're not independent, which again is just another way of saying that your age did influence your personal rating for uh, personal appearance. Um, again, you wouldn't want to say that your appearance influenced your age. That would be backward. But you would just say they're not independent. Then you don't have to make that judgment on which one affects the other. Because uh, sometimes it can be a little more confusing. But again, you always speak to HA in context at the end. And since we rejected, that means there is evidence for HA. All right. So was there a trend that followed with our result? Again, the follow-up analysis would be to do something like we did on that first uh, table, uh, page with the table, which is just showing that, for instance, the younger age group had a higher percentage of seven ratings. The oldest age group had a lowest percent of seven or a lower percentage of seven ratings. So what we do, again, is we'd look at, in a, in a simpler problem, we'd look at all of the iterations of our formula all of the O minus E squared divided by E, again, in this case, there were 42 of them, and just kind of look for ones that resulted in really big numbers, because those really big numbers then are situations where we know the observed and expected were really far from each other, um, for especially relative to sample size, that caused us to, um, to, to reject in this case. And so in the end, we have all of our, our results. Again, we went back and put our matrix B. We copied the matrix B into that second condition. And again, just to get to matrix B really quickly uh, is second matrix. And then you just click down to B and hit enter. And then you may have to hit the over arrow before you hit the down arrow. It kind of locks you out of that. So just a heads up on that. But um, 
but that matrix B, then copy that for condition number two to verify. And usually it'll be pretty manageable as usually it's about uh, six cells that you're copying down. So, uh, and then you just note that all of those are five or more if they are. So again, here's the curve. We saw 30 degrees of freedom in our example. So this just kept getting moved out to the right because the degrees of freedom were, were bigger. Um, in conclusion, um, just again, make sure that you understand what makes it an independence versus goodness of fit. And again, independence, the observed values in independence would have two plus rows and two plus columns. Whereas in goodness of fit, the observed will be just one column of numbers or just one row of numbers. And again, it all has to do with having two variables in play on an independence test. And again, in order for there to be independence, there needs to be two variables to be independent of each other. And on a goodness of fit, there's one variable. And the last point is you are gonna see the term homogeneity, which is a chi-square uh, test. And it's very similar to independence, in fact, um, for a long time, we just kind of bundled them into one. But homogeneity just means rather than like our sample here, um, where it was one big group that we just broke up into age groups, homogeneity by design will bring in multiple populations. So it might be like people from the East Coast against people from the West Coast or people from Minnetonka against people from Medina or whatever it happens to be, where there's two plus populations and we're basically seeing if those two plus populations are different in any fundamental way. Whereas independence is really about one population that's split up into subgroups. So it might be just Minnetonka high school students broken up by grade, and that would be an independence test versus homogeneity where we'd say, okay, we have Minnetonka high school students, and then we have Edina high school students, and we're gonna look at if they view something differently, whatever it may be. So homogeneity, just a kind of a, a specific type of independence test. All the work is the same for the test. It just has a little different background in terms of where the data came from. Thank you as always for listening and have a good day.